All right, if you haven't gotten a copy of God's Word, there's some around. Um, if you could grab one, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 12. <laughs> Wow, that's nice. Man, look, I'm making it hop up in here. All right. Let me set it right here. Man, wow. Yeah, let's uh, get the beat going. All right, so we're going to be in Genesis chapter 12. Last week we saw the Tower of Babel and how we got so many different languages around the world and how God just put people all over the world and now we're trying to get languages to have the word of God in it so that in Matthew it talks about how the word of God will be preached in every nation then the end will come so even though God scattered all of us and have all these different these languages now we're trying to get his word into that so then the end can come and and, and we can be with him forever and ever so we're, we're at the Tower of Babel, but um, we have been going through the book of Genesis. And of course, I always go over this. Who was the author? We got that one up there. The author of Genesis is who? Moses, right? And then Moses, we, we, we think that he, he kind of wrote this book around 1525 B.C. Um, but the part one of the book of Genesis is Genesis 1 through 11. And we've already covered all that. So we're going to actually start... Uh, part two today. So part one was all about the creation, the fall, right? Adam and Eve, when they messed up and they sinned and they got consequences and now sin has been tempting us all over. And, and, and then the flood happened and, and, and we see Noah and his family get saved and they're, they're told to repopulate the earth. And then, and then we see the Tower of Babel, all right? And that was last week. And now we get to part two. So what is part two? Part two is the beginning of the Hebrew nation. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. That is chapter 12 all the way through chapter 50. So this is the beginning of God's chosen nation. You see all these people, all right, they got scattered all over, right, with the different languages. And God makes a promise today. Look in Genesis chapter 12. Verse 1, we're going to see the central idea today is Abram, okay, it wasn't Abraham yet. It was Abram to start. Abram makes mistakes and God still uses him. All right, and so that's what we were talking about earlier. I was sharing with you, here's a guy that's going to make a mistake and it was Abram. But how did he make his mistake? We'll see that in just a few minutes. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through verse 3. This is probably some of the most important verses in all the Bible. You know how John 3.16 is really popular, John 3.16? This is probably some of the most popular ones, and a lot of people don't realize it should be this popular. Because why? It says, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country and your people. Leave your father's family. Go to the land I'll show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you. And I will put a curse on anyone who calls down a curse on you. All nations on earth will be blessed because of you. Do you guys realize this is so important? God's plan to save humans... It, it came from, number one, Adam and Eve, all right? So I'm, there's this process. I'm going to let you see this, the salvation process. God provides salvation. I don't know if you've ever seen it like this before, but check. For one marriage, Adam and Eve, because of their sin, they deserve death. He could have just killed them right there and started again. But he didn't. There's something in God that wants to save us, that loves us. And he continues with us, even though Adam and Eve make a mistake. So he, he, he certainly had all the right to start over and just destroy them and start again. But look at what he does. He saves one marriage. Then with the flood, he sees Noah and his family. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to save this family. 
And so here, here he is, Noah and the flood, the family gets saved, and, and, and they start repopulating the earth. What's the next step? He said, for one nation. So he looks down and he sees Abram. And he, he makes a, a promise to him. And that's what we see right here in these first three verses. He says, I'm going to, it's going to be you. You know, you guys have heard the song, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons, had Father Abraham, right? I am one of them, so are you. It, it, it's like, here it is. He, he says one nation, and it's going to be the Hebrew nation, the Israelite nation. That's how, we're, the reason we get Israel, and we're going to see this, is because Jacob's name is turned to Israel. All right, and so Jacob's name, God says your name is going to be Israel, and that's where we get the name Israelites. Right? That, it all started with Jacob. It didn't come from Abram yet. All right? It was the Hebrew people, these Hebrew people. This is his nation. So God says, I'm going to save a nation now. Can you see it getting bigger and bigger and bigger? And then until this part right here, watch this. For everyone. For all of us. Because it wasn't then just Jewish people, Israelite people, Hebrew people. That was his nation. But then when Jesus comes on the scene, we saw it all when we studied last year, the book of Acts. Paul was going around trying to tell people, yeah, I'm Jewish, but guess what? Jesus, the whole gospel, the whole salvation message is for anyone. And for you and me in here, who most of us in here, I, I would probably say most all of us in here are not Jewish by birth or heritage. So you know what this means? Salvation is for us. Isn't that amazing? This is God's plan. When he could have just said, uh-uh, no, I'm starting over. He didn't because guess what? He thought you and I were worth it to keep going, to keep populating the earth, to keep getting the gospel message of salvation out to each and every one of them. It means you're important. And when the enemy comes and says, Ah, uh, you don't mean much. Ah, uh, you don't have much value. You can say, no, 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 no. I'm worth it. Because God sent his son Jesus to make salvation possible for me. You can say that. Isn't that amazing? So these are very important verses because it all starts with one man in this nation, Abram. All right, so Abram must have been a really great guy, right? Like Noah. You know, Noah was a guy that walked with God. He was righteous. He, did, he was great. Abram, he must have been this great guy, right? Well, we're going to see he makes some mistakes, all right? Watch this. This is, uh, gets good. So Abram, verse 4, Abram, he did just as the Lord had told him. Lot went with him, all right? So who was Lot? That's his nephew. Abram was 75 years old. When he left Herod. Now, I, I need you to understand this, okay? He's saying, get up and go to a land I will show you. When you get up to move your whole family, don't you typically know where you're going? I mean, you have a destination, right? You have a place that you're going. But Abram didn't. He said, I want you to get up and I want you to go. Now, are you in a place where that is happening right now? Sometimes you're like, Man, I don't know which way to go, God. I'm in a, a place and, and I, I just feel like you're not telling me where to go or what to do or how to be or what. Sometimes we can feel that way. But if we just follow them one step at a time, let that be the, the next thing, the next step. Because God told Abram, I want you to get up and go to a land I'll show you. He didn't know the destination yet. So sometimes it's hard to walk by faith because you don't know the end. You don't know the end result. So here he is. He did as the Lord had told him. He left Haran. And we're going to see a map toward the end. But watch this. He took his wife, Sarai. It was not Sarah yet. We know Abraham and Sarah, right? No, it was Abram and Sarai and his nephew Lot. They took all the things they had gotten in Haran. They also took the workers they had gotten there. They set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. All right, so God was leading them through the steps all the way to the land of Canaan. 
They arrived. Verse 6. Verse 6. Abram traveled through the land. He went as far as the large tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the people of Canaan were living in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram at Shechem. He said, I will give this land to your children after you. So what did Abram do? Abram built an altar there to honor the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, Abram went on toward the hills east of Bethel. He set up his tent there. Bethel was to the west and Ai was to the east. Abram built an altar there and worshiped the Lord. Okay, he did it again. Built another altar and worshiped. Then Abram left and continued toward the Negev desert. I want you to see something, okay, as we wrap this little part up. Good times were happening. Abram's obeying and worshiping. All right, right? Abram is obeying and worshiping. These are good times. How easy is it to obey and worship the Lord when times are good? Right? Yeah, times are good. You know, obeying and, and worshiping, that's easy. He built an altar, two different places. You can see he's walking with God. But sometimes as the journey gets longer, it's going to get a little more interesting. All right, now, Abram goes down <coughs> to Egypt. You ever been in a valley? You ever been in a valley in life? And you're like, man, Lord, I don't know if I'm ever going to get out of this pit or this valley that I'm in. I just feel stuck down at the bottom. Guess what? This going down to Egypt is like almost going down into the valley for Abram. Because there was no food. There was no food. And so what happens in verse 10? At the time, there wasn't enough food in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while. And as he was about to enter Egypt, he spoke to his wife, Sarai. Now, you t you're telling me the Bible can't get romantic? All right, watch what, he, watch what happens here. He says to Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. Wow, look at Abram. Man, Abram is complimenting his wife. I don't know if you realize this, but Sarai... She was hot. She was good looking. All right. Now, I, we need to properly translate this into today's terms. All right. So in order to do that, I want you guys to realize this. Um, so I'm going to get Morgan. You come on up here. Okay, Morgan, come on up here. You know how in a movie, I don't know if you've ever seen when they, when they film movies, they'll go like this right here. Take one. Right. And they'll jump out the way. And then the. The movie will go on, and then they'll say, cut, 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 and then they'll do it again and take another, all right? So I need you to be that person, okay? I'm going to ask Jen, Miss Jen, come on up here. All right, Miss Jen, come on up here. <coughs> all right, so we get the lines down. All right. All right, so Sarai. All right, you, go. you ready? I'm, I'm, I'm getting my line down. You ready? All right, ready? Sarai. Sarai, did you just come out of the oven? Because you're hot. <laughs> cut, cut, cut. Cut, cut. Okay, all right, all right. All right, let me, uh, okay, here we go. Get my line. All right, let's, action, okay. Sarai, Sarai, life with you is like a pencil. Life without you is pointless. That one, that one, not, not, we're going to cut that one. Yeah, that's, that's not going to be. All right, let me get my line down. All right. Sarai. Oh, go ahead. Wait, I'm... Sarai, you must be tired because you've been running through my mind all night. Good. Uh, all right, let me see. All right, all right. Okay, here we go. All right. Sarai, are you a parking ticket? Because you got fine written all over you. <laughs> all right, all right, let me see. All right, let me see. All right. all right, here we go. Okay, Sarai, is your name Google? Because you've all I've been searching for. Oh. All right, is that, all right, was that good? All right, all right, that's it. Thank you very much, all right.
All right, so now that we have established Sarah, or no, it's not Sarah yet, right? It's Sarai. Sarai was hot. She was good looking. All right, I want you to get this in your head. Sarai was good looking. And so guess what Abram does? Abram's kind of nervous because he's like, honey, baby, I know you are beautiful. This is right here in the scripture. I'm not, t- I'm, I'm not lying. This is verse 12. Now watch this. The people of Egypt will see you and they will say, this is his wife. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to kill me, but they'll let you live. So you know what Abram's afraid of? Sarah, Sarai, I keep saying Sarah. Sarai is so hot that Abram's afraid of his own life. He thinks the Egyptians are going to kill him and take her. So he's like, babe, babe, we got to come up with a plan. We got to figure this out because I'm going to get killed because you're so hot. That's what he's saying, right? And he's, th- he's thinking, he's thinking. And, and, and what does he say? He says, verse 13, he says, I tell you what, just say you're my sister. Then I'll be treated well because of you. And my life will be spared because of you. All right. So. All right, 75-year-old Abram and his smoking hot wife, 65 years old, Sarai, arrive down in Egypt. All right, in verse 14, the people of Egypt saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. I'm telling you, she was a head turner, right? She, she, she caught the eyes of the guys. And, and then verse 16 or 15, when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they bragged to Pharaoh about her. Hey, Pharaoh, did you see Sarai? Oh, my goodness. This is what it's saying. Sarai was then taken into his palace. Pharaoh treated Abram well because of her. All right. So Abram got respected. Right. So the plan is going according to to plant. So Abram gained more sheep and cattle. So Pharaoh's giving him things, you know, it's, he also got more male and female donkeys and he gained more male and female servants and some camels, man, Abram is getting rich off of Pharaoh. Verse 17, but the Lord sent a terrible sickness or terrible sicknesses on Pharaoh and everyone in his palace. He did it because of Abram's wife, Sarai. Whoa. So Pharaoh sent for Abram. Somehow Pharaoh figured all this out because he brings Abram in, verse 18, and says, what have you done to me? He said, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? It's like, why did you do this, Pharaoh? is calling out Abram like, why'd you lie to me? Why did you say she is my sister? That's why I took her to be my wife. See, Pharaoh had the idea, well, since she was just a sister of Abram, I'll take her as my wife. But he's saying to him, like, if you told me that she was your wife, I would have never taken her as my wife. I would have left her alone. Why did you say, verse 19, why did you say she's my sister? That's why I took her to be my wife. Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. And then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men. They sent him on his way. And he left with his wife and everything he had. Wow. What what do we learn from this? There's so much packed in here. First off, fear can lead to wrong choices. How many choices have we made in our life out of fear instead of faith? Think about this. Next time you you got two choices to make, what are you are you making your choice on fear or on faith? Abram, things were going good. He was obeying, he was worshiping, and then he starts thinking. He starts getting scared for his own life. He's like, we got to come up with a plan. We got to come up with a plan here, right? And he sets up this plan. And and man, it's it's wrong from the get-go. He didn't have faith in the Lord that he would be true to his promise. He just said, God just said, you're going to be the father of many nations. 
We don't listen to God's word sometimes. We listen to the enemy and these fears and all these things start coming into our minds and we don't trust the Lord and our faith gets low and our fear gets high and we start making these wrong choices. That's what can happen. We can have faith in God. That can help us. Why? Why is it so easy to lie? We were talking about that uh, at youth night, Friday night. Why is it so easy for us to lie? Give me, give me some reasons. Why do you think it's so easy for us to lie? I mean, obviously, one, we're scared for our life, right? Abram pointed that out to us. What, what, why else is it? Give us excuses to lie. Why, why do we lie? Yeah, yeah, make them believe you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you want them? That's, that's right. So, so somebody comes to you and says, hey, have you ever um, b- built a roof on the thing? Oh, yeah, I built a roof before. <laughs> you have no idea how to build a roof, right? But you want to make them think, yeah, I know what I'm doing, right? Yeah, exactly. You want to get them to believe you, right? What else? What else can, can get us to lie? To get out of trouble. Oh, we won't want to face the consequence, right? And so we, uh, we say it was their fault or, or somebody else's fault or, yeah, yeah, we don't want to get blamed. And, yeah. Huh? Yes, we are, are born. Into, our, our natural tendency is to lie, right, instead of telling the truth. It's, it's, it's natural for us. But when we accept Christ and we have the Holy Spirit and we have the belt of truth, that's what we were talking about at youth night, having a belt of truth wrapped around our waist. And when we carry that truth with us, oh man, God can help us not to lie in those situations we're naturally wanting to to lie in, right? And so, yeah, I just thought a couple other things. Maybe it's to take away harm to someone else or to get what we want. We'll lie to get what we want Um, because to confuse the conversation so that people won't keep asking about things, right? You ever know these people? They'll, 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 they know how to confuse the conversation so that you don't get them in a corner of having to, to lie or tell the truth. Yeah, so the, this is just kind of, I mean, understand this. The father of lies is the enemy. And so when we lie, we're becoming most like the enemy because he knows how to lie. He's the father of lies. And so We've got to really start thinking about what truth is, who truth is, and that's Jesus, and when we're tempted to lie. So Abram is afraid, right? Abram is afraid, and fear can lead to wrong choices. You'll notice Abram, he's building altars to God at the different places he's traveling, but he never builds one in Egypt. Isn't that interesting? He never built an altar in Egypt. Sometimes when we're living in that pattern of sin, our worship to God is just not there because there's something blocking that relationship. And and when we confess and we say, sorry, Lord, for doing that, it's like the the bridge is open back up again, right? And we have that relationship. It's like if I do something to hurt my wife, I say something mean or things like that. I, I go to her and I say, I'm sorry for that thing I said because she's hurt, you know? And, and, and then that relationship can can, and have forgiveness and, and, and healing, right? So, then another thing we can learn from this, a half-truth is still a whole lie. Now, I want you to understand something. This might be really shocking to you, but Sarai was really his half-sister. Did you guys realize that? Did you guys realize that? They both had the same father. And back then, when the earth was populating, it was, and the, this was before the law was given to Moses, correct? That, that this was kind of a common practice, that, that they were marrying in within family members. You know, of course you had to when Noah was first starting to populate the earth, correct? And, and so, it's a half-truth. He's like, all right, instead of telling them, you're my wife, just tell him you're my sister. And Abram probably was like, that's still kind of the truth, right? You know, but he was trying to deceive. And so that was not the, 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 whole, the whole point here is a half truth 
is still a whole lie. You ever, you ever been in that situation where you tried to justify what you said and it was, it was mischievous, it was deceiving, but you tried to justify it by going, well, it's sort of the truth. <laughs> Don't, aren't we there? Sometimes we do that. It's sort of the truth. A half truth is still a whole lie. Another thing we can learn, our response to ungodly requests. Here is Abram telling you know, his wife Sarai, hey, do this. And guess what? You might have people in your life, maybe they're bosses or, or people over you, or so, somewhere, somehow, maybe you've seen this before, but they've told you to do something that is against God's word. How do you respond to somebody that gives you an ungodly request? Well, here's the thing. Keep going. We're... Yep, there we already got that one. Here it is. Always base it on God's word. And always base it on the direction of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is to, to, to convict you of wrongdoing. And the Holy Spirit can show you and remind you of what God's word says. So if it goes against God's word, you know it's wrong. And so how do we handle that? How do we handle it? Perhaps God will show us how to make a gracious appeal that will change the other person's mind, right? We do it with respect and tell them maybe God will show us a creative way to respond to that person's need without doing wrong. Or maybe God will want us to respectfully refuse to obey that request. Even if we must pay a price, it's always better to obey God. Always better to obey God. Next point. In spite of Abram's lack of faith, God protects them. He had a whole lack of faith, didn't he? He got really scared for his own life. And he says, let's start weaving this whole plan of deception. But God still protects them. He protects them. Because the Hebrew race and God's promise was, was the future. And the Messiah was going to come from Abraham and, and through Isaac, Jacob. Well, think, here's the next point, and then we'll move on. Think about being corrected by an unbeliever. Pharaoh, he wasn't a believer in, in the God of, of Abram. And Pharaoh was the one calling him out, saying, man, why didn't you tell me the truth? You ever been corrected by somebody that was not godly? Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, uh, I love on, uh, on the today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you. God can use people and, and, and somebody that's not even godly to, to convict your heart. Say, man, that's, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that, you know? And, and then, who knows, maybe God will get by you saying sorry or repenting or asking God's grace. Somehow that message will get back to that person that corrected you. And they'll see your response. And then they maybe can become a believer in Christ. You never know how God's plan will come about. When we sin, here's that point, when we sin in front of unbelievers, we especially dishonor God's name. When we act in front of unbelievers, we should be showing the picture of Jesus. And Abram certainly wasn't doing that in front of Pharaoh. So, last part we're going to wrap up with is chapter 13. I just This is a bridge to get us to chapter 14. This is going to show us what happens on the journey. So what happens is Abram and his family come back up out of Egypt. And where do they go? In verse, uh, chapter 13, we see this. Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev desert. He took his wife and everything he had. Lot went with them. Remember, that's, that's uh, Abram's nephew, right? Verse 2, Abram had become very rich. He had a lot of livestock and silver and gold. And from the Negev desert, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel. He came to a place where Bethel and Ai, or between Bethel and Ai, that's where his tent had been earlier. 
he had also built an altar there. So he returned, right? And he worshiped the Lord. Sometimes when we go through the valley, it's a tough place to be. And then when we come back out of it, man, it's like we return right to that same place we were before. And we're like, man, thank you, God, for bringing me out of the pit. Thank you, God, for rescuing me. And thank you for not abandoning me and still wanting to use me. And so he was there. He worshiped the Lord there. Then Lot was moving around with Abram. Lot also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land didn't have enough food for both of them. They had large herds and many servants, so they weren't able to stay together. Verse 7, the people who took care of Abram's herds and those who took care of Lot's herds began to argue. And the Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. So Abram said to Lot, let's not argue with each other. The people who took care of your herds and those who took care of mine shouldn't argue with one another. After all, we're part of the same family. Isn't the whole land in front of you? Let's separate. If you go left, I'll go right. If you go right, I'll go left. So Abram's trying to bring peace to this whole situation. And he's looking at Lot saying, hey, Lot, you go right, I'll go left. If you go left, I'll go right. You choose. He's given Lot the choice. So Lot looked up. He saw the whole Jordan River Valley and had plenty of water. I'm going to see if we can put that uh, map up there. Do you see the map that has like the, the picture of the valley? Now nah, keep going down. Keep going down. It's a, it's a picture more than a map. You see it? Is it not, is it not there? Let me, let me see. Sorry, I want... Oh, I didn't bring it in. Yeah, this one right here. Yeah. All right, so here it is. Let's, let's kind of give you a picture. All right, so they're, they're here, um, Bethel and Ai, right? And, and you can see this whole valley full of water, right? You see all this? Well, Lot chooses to come down this way. And he's going to come down and around, and he's going to settle right about in this area where they think Sodom and Gomorrah were you know, at that time. And so he's near this place right here. And, and Abraham, he kind of settles all up in this area. All right. So that's kind of where this map is. Now go to the map before that, like you had up. Just so you guys see the journey. Uh, keep going before that one. Up, up back in the. Uh, all right. Yeah. So this is, this, this is kind of where Lot. Okay. You remember that Dead Sea that was there? This is where Lot settled. And then this was all where Abraham, now you can see Jerusalem, all right? That's one of the big cities that is famous in, in Jesus' time. This is all where Abraham started, all right? So that whole nation, this is Israel, right? Um, and then go to the one before it. Um, yeah, this one. All right, so this was the huge journey from the beginning. All right, I'm going to stand over here. Ur is where... Um, uh, Abraham's or Abram's father started out. Okay, they started out here, came up to here, and then Haran. This is where Genesis 12 starts. Haran, uh, Terah, who is Abram's father, died while they were here, and Genesis 12 picks up on leave your family, leave Haran, and I want you to go on a journey, and they journey down this side. All right, so they come down here, they're settling in. They get down to here, and this is where he kind of builds that altar, and then he goes down to Egypt when there's no food. And then that's when he comes back up, and Lot and Abram split at this point. Lot comes down here, and this is where Abram winds up. And that's the beginning of the Hebrew nation. The Israelites all starts in that area right there. So just so you kind of have a reference. But he's going down, the, um, verse 7 the people who, uh, let's go to verse 9. Uh, no, 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 verse, verse 10, sorry. Lot looked up and he saw that whole Jordan River Valley had plenty of water. It was like the garden of the Lord. It was like the land of Egypt near Zoar. That was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose the whole Jordan River Valley for himself. Then he started out toward the east and the two men separated. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, and Lot lived among the cities of the Jordan River Valley, and he set up his tents near Sodom. Verse 13, the men of Sodom, though, were evil. 
They were sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord spoke to Abram after Lot had left him, and he said, look, look up from where you are. Look north and south and east and west. I will give you all of the land that you see. I will give it to you and your children after you forever. Now notice, he didn't say this until Lot left. And he looked at Abram and said, My promise is with you, Abram, and your children. And this is the land that I'm giving you. Verse 16. I will make your children like the dust of the earth. Can dust be counted? If it can, then your children can be counted. It's almost too numerous to count, right? He said, go, walk through the land, see how long and wide it is that I'm giving it to you. So Abram moved his tents. He went to live near the large trees of Mamre at Hebron. And there, what did he do? He finished up in worship. He built another altar to the Lord, to honor the Lord. So, last points, we'll finish up. Abram worshipped God both in good times and bad. When Sarai was safely returned to him, and it, that was the good, good times, and in the hard times, right? When Lot was selfishly looking to take the best land. In good times and hard times, God is still good. He's still worthy of being worshipped. So we can also worship him regardless of feelings or circumstances. What's something good God has done for you or your family that you can praise him for? What's something difficult in your life right now that you can worship him in the midst of? Trusting him to bring good from it. Practice worshiping God in both good and hard situations this week. Worship's a wonderful way to build your faith. That's why we chose this song, Promises, this morning. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness to me. God of Abraham, right? That's what it said in the beginning. Next point, we don't have to be perfect for God to use us in his plan. Abram was not perfect. He made mistakes, and sometimes he did not believe God would protect him. But because of the faith he did have, God blessed him and used him in his wonderful plan for the world. So the challenge becomes to us. Will you choose to believe that God will use you even if you make mistakes sometimes? We've all made mistakes in here. All of us. Me. You. We've all made mistakes. And God will still use us in His plan. And so are you going to trust that? Are you going to have faith in God? Because what He says is true. And God made promises to Abram. And what are his promises to us? Find them. They're in here. God promises us many things. We just got to trust him and have faith in him. So I, I'd like for the praise band to come up. As we close today, I'd like to sing that song again. Close us today again in worship. Singing, great is your faithfulness, God. And so no matter if you're in the valley... Or if you're up on the mountaintop, you have something that you can worship God for. And so I'm, I'm going to keep you guys in prayer throughout this week. I thank you guys for coming today, worshiping with us, but most of all, hearing the truth of God's word. And, and I, I pray that God will just use this to, to help you in your everyday situation. Let's go ahead and stand. We'll pray, and then we'll have the praise man. God, I thank you so much for this time that you have shown us an example. One of the most famous men in all the scripture, Abram, and how he made a mistake, and yet you still used him. Lord, let that speak. Whoop. Yeah. Let that speak to our hearts, God. Let that show us that no matter our past, God, you still want to use us. Thank you for your grace and your mercy on our lives that you still want to keep us moving forward despite what we've done. God, help us to, to, to ask for forgiveness. Lord, I pray that if there's somebody here that doesn't know you as Savior and Lord, that for the very first time they would, they would say, Jesus, you are the payment for my sin. You're the one that died on the cross to save me from my sin. Lord, I, I want you to be Lord of my life. Jesus, thank you for dying and not staying dead, but raising back to life. 
to conquer sin and death. Lord, I want to trust you with my life. Lord, I, I pray today would be the day of salvation for them. Lord, let them cry out to you and enter into salvation. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for these words to this song that we can just listen to and that we can sing to you even throughout this week. God, thank you for your promises. In Jesus' name, amen.